everything came from the spirit world. If you remember in Genesis, <clears throat> when God created heaven and earth, uh, everything we see in the physical world, the expanse, the sky, the, the galaxies, all the stars, all these physical things that we can see with our naked eyes, with our physical eyes, came from the spirit world that we can't see. Because God came from the spirit world. So because of that, it is very natural to explain and to understand that if you want to understand the things of life, the deeper things of life, some people say, well, I want to find out the meaning of life. And they try all kinds of philosophy, all kinds of theories. You know, uh, you, know you, you can see that, you know, Hollywood is trying to suggest what the meaning of life is. And usually it's very dark and very bleak. And, you know, people in the world and different philosophy, theologists and religions always trying to define what the meaning of life is without first leading people to the source which is the father of all spirit that is our father but you can't go to the father of all spirit if you don't even know if you are a spirit so we explain to people that uh, it is very important that you understand that you as a human being is not your body it's not your soul your intellect your emotion it's not your mind it's your spirit unfortunately most people can't locate the spirit. They don't know what that is. You know, they, they think it's some, you know, they think some kind of electronic pulse or electrical pulse in our, in our brain, some chemical in our brains. And so they're trying to explain away the spirit. But, you know, most people don't understand what the spirit is. They can't locate what it is. And one reason is because most people, if they have not been born again, the spirit is dormant. The Bible says the spirit is dead. What that means is really not the, 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 the uh, termination of existence. It's it's really um, uh, 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 your communication, your spirit not able to now communicate with the Father who had created you. And when God declared Adam that you will die if you eat this fruit of the tree, they didn't physically die. They were still together. But all of a sudden, they now not able to communicate with the Father. It was able, you know, they were able to do that subsequently only through the sacrificial lamb, through the blood, and so forth. And then so the, the whole idea is that your spirit man is dormant, therefore cannot communicate with God. God or have lost that, that ability, Human, humanity had lost the ability. But you know, uh, the question we always ask is that, you know, we want to know the things of life, the meaning of life, the deeper things in life, and, and we cannot go through it with philosophy or even theology or even you know, inspiration or ideas, and, but it has to be in the Spirit and more specifically being connected to the Spirit of God and so that the Holy Spirit can teach us and reveal to us. And so how then do we resurrect this dormant spirit? So before I get to that, so the two things you need to recognize is number one is that you need to recognize that you are a spirit and then you need to realize that your spirit is dormant, number two, and cut off from God. And uh, the, how do we then resurrect this dormant spirit? Uh, we spoke about it quickly. I'm just going to kind of go through a review a little bit. Is that you'll need to be born again. Jesus in John chapter 3 told Nicodemus who had such a desire to discuss the deep things of the things of God, the spiritual things of God. And Jesus didn't even entertain his, his, uh, his discussion. Didn't even talk to him about all the theological uh, th discussion that, that he would want to bring to the Lord. And Jesus, the only thing he said to him was, you need to be born again. You need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born of the water. And so that's a born again experience. Now, when you have experience being born in the Spirit, you will have a new sensation. Some, about eight people raised their hands last week. You gave your heart to the Lord. Or that you rededicated your life to the Lord. You would notice, if you pay attention, there's a different sensation. And the reason is because the Word of God say that when you're born again, all, all things have passed away. All things have become new. And some people ask, what, why is that experience? This is why. Because now your dormant spirit all of a sudden can communicate and sense and commune with the presence of God. Let me give you an illustration here. If you're a blind person and you know, all your buddies are blind... And that all of a sudden you receive eyesight the first time in your life. This is a sensation that you never perceive. People will tell, try, to try to tell you, you know, there's different colors. You would have no idea what that means. All of a sudden you open your eyes, you can see yellow, you can see blue, you can see green, you can see red. 
There is a new sensation. It opens up your horizon. It causes you to see things more than or experience and perceive things a lot more than you could possibly imagine. But try to tell it to all your other buddies who are still blind. They would not have a clue. But try to tell the people that have received the same miracle, they will have the same appreciation. That is, this new sensation is like, unlike any other. Or if you're deaf, you can't hear. People will tell you, you know, uh, you know, there's music, you know, there's this stereo, you know, you can listen to things in stereo. I don't know if you ever, you know, I, I was born in a time when they have a technology to introduce a stereo technology. So right before then, it's all mono, you know. I wouldn't even ask some of you to raise your hand to tell me if you have the same experience, but, you know, we would date ourselves. But, you know, we, 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 I was born in a time when, when they had no stereo, and then when I was younger, maybe um, younger than Matthew's age, maybe about six years old, seven years old, and I heard about stereo. And so, so one young guy came to the church, you know, and, and he bought this little stereo thing, and, and it was kind of big, you know. He brought it to the church and trying to share his experience. And then we all listened to it. It's like, wow, it feels like we are there. Right? And, and so for the people who are deaf, they, it doesn't matter if it's mono, stereo, one side, two, you know, whatever, right? You know, these days, you know, if you have a home theater, you know, you set up speakers everywhere, right? All seven ways or whatever, right? You got subwoofer, front, back, middle, middle, back, you know, inside, you know. And so when the plane would fly by in a movie, you could hear the plane go, woo. That's a sensation that that plane is moving. That's why all the boys like to set up all these sophisticated speakers at home, right? But deaf people would not be able to comprehend that. They would, they would go, what, what was that? It's the same thing as those who are born of the Spirit. You have a new sensation that nobody can explain except those who've actually experienced it. But I know most of us want more than just a sensation. You want something deeper. You want to answer questions. You want to see you want to see things that nobody could see. You want God to reveal secrets to you, revelation to you. You want to be able to read the Word of God and God will teach you. It is important to have teachers. The Word of God says teachers are important. Teacher, pastor, prophets, evangelists, and, and uh, pre, uh, pastor, <laughs> Five-four ministry. It's important to have all the five-four ministry, right? And, and it's important to teach and so forth. But, you know, at the end of the day, is that God also wants to teach you. His Holy Spirit wants to teach you. The Word of God, by, in Paul the Apostle said to the church that he was ministering to, he said, you no need of a teacher to teach you because the Holy Spirit is already in you to teach you. But some people say, I don't then need to be taught by anybody. Well, that's, that's, that's not the reason. God gave us fivefold ministry so that we can receive also uh, from other people. You know, I, when I was younger, I used to have that thought that, you know, all these people, that, those are amazing preachers and teachers, they're great, but, you know, I can hear from the Holy Spirit myself. But I realized that God, in His grace, had only given me a limited capacity. With all the revelation He gave me, it was still very limited, and that He needed His body to function together. So I start to open up and start to listen and learn from other people. And I started to see things that I could never see on my own. I, I spend time with the Lord. I study, I, I, pray, I worship, and God, the Holy Spirit did teach me, and, and I do hear from Him. But if you shut all the other people out, then, then you're missing out the incredible amount of blessings that God have available, has available for you through others, brother and sister. Anyways, so the, you want something deeper. So you, you want your spirit to be here from the Lord, to sense the presence of God, to know things, and to operate in the supernatural. Although you are a spirit, now this is part two now, I just finished my intro. You possess a soul, and you have a body. Your body is not you. Are you here this morning? So, you know, you may have a, a really fit body, all ripped, you know, like Angel. That's not you, bro. It will soon pass. <laughs> More ways than you think, you know. When you have kids, you know, anyway, so 
Yeah. But, you know, and then a lot of people identify themselves with their intellect. You know, my education, how smart I am. That's your soul. That's not you. The true you is your spirit. And so we've discovered about the spirit. We talk about the spirit. But you still nevertheless have your soul to contend with and have your body to contend with. In fact, I would say, including Christians, most of us are most conscious of our body, you know, our flesh, and our emotion. We are more conscious of that than of our spirit. Because everything around us would want to pull our attention to focus on our soul, our emotion, and our flesh. So, so much so that, you know, we get so distracted, so much so that the most believers get so distracted that they would even forget about their spirit. Let me ask you this question before you come to service today. Throughout the week, how many times have you thought of your spirit? Did you go, oh, hi, wow, spirit. You know, you're most conscious of your look, right? Our physical body. You wake up in the morning, you go to take a shower, the first thing you look at is, at least I do. And then after that, I'll tell my wife, you know, I don't want to work out anymore, man. It doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. All this work I put in goes to nothing, you know. And then she goes, well, you eat a lot. That's the problem. Well, that's true too. So we are very conscious of our look, conscious about our flesh, how we feel. You know, it was too hot. Oh, it's so hot, you know. Oh, it's so cold. Oh, it's so cold. We're very focused on our flesh. And some of us are very focused on our emotion because everything is drawing us to pay attention. So, we, so because of that, we allow things to distract us and we forget about who we are and what we are. And so we're easily being de deceived and manipulated by the world and even by religious systems. And so we continue to struggle like everybody else. In fact, I'll say most believers are struggling more than unbelievers. Because unbelievers, they don't have to contend with this judgment thing when you walk into the church. Unbelievers don't have to feel guilty. <laughs> Am I not speaking the truth? Because you got saved, you were so happy for a few moments, all of a sudden you feel so condemned. You're not giving enough, you're not doing enough, you're not smiling enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not having a tie, you're not having a, you know. You know, God, does, he, it is not His will that you constantly come under condemnation and judgment. That's why the Word of God said, there is therefore now no condemnation of, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit that is in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Condemnation is a way to manipulate. Condemnation is a way to, to control. And you know, we, 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 we use that on our kids often. You know, we make them feel condemned. Like my son these days is smarter now. He's like, hey, Dad, no condemnation. But I tell him, I'm still your dad, man. I don't care. <laughs> But, you know, like, it's, it's a way that, unfortunately, even religious system, doesn't matter what religion, we use it, we, see, we, we tell people, you know, if you don't do this, this will happen to you. That's, you know, it's, just, it's all fear-driven and condemnation-driven. But it is not the will of God for us to live that way. Yes, it is His will that you live in victory. Yes, it is His will that you do not live in sin. Yes, it is His will that you have a healthy body, but you also have a healthy spirit. Yes, it is His will that you live in triumph and victory in everything that you're involved in. But those will not come through condemnation. Those come from the grace of God. Those come from the Holy Spirit. It is His idea that you live in victory. It is His idea that you live in holiness. It it is his idea, but he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't want you to achieve that through your own strength, but through his grace, and that it is through his Holy Spirit living in and through your spirit. Nevertheless, we're still contending, contending with our flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. 
Do you know the desire of your flesh is constantly battling against your spirit? Your inner spirit sometimes trying to scream at you, but the desire of the flesh is so strong. And the desire of the spirit is against the flesh. If you're born again, your spirit has been renewed and regenerated. There's always this contention on the inside. That's, you know, you don't even have people to give you condemnation. You feel there's an opposing forces on the inside. These are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is a contention going on. So how, 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 do, you, how, how do you then live in the Spirit and allow your Spirit then to become the lead so that you can live supernaturally, so that you can hear the voice of God, so you can walk in supernatural things, so that you're not being manipulated and controlled by your flesh or by your emotion. How do you do that? Because it is there. Listen, when you get saved, you still have your memories. How many of you, when you got saved, you say, Jesus, come and give me a new experience, and you sense the presence of God and His Spirit touch you, and then you forgot about all the mistakes you've made? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. No, you, you, do, you do remember all the mistakes you, you make. You do. We, we, none of us forget. How many of you, after you become saved, your skin look like babies? Like the general, right? Your skin looked like baby. Nothing happened to your skin. Nothing happened to your body. How many of you, after you got saved, you become super healthy? Now, it is the will of God that you live in good health, live in healing, and we're going to talk more about it next week when we have communion together. It is His will that you're healed, and you're healed of all sickness. But you know, when you got saved, you didn't turn around and go, oh, look, at I got all these muscles now. All the wrinkles are gone. No, you have your flesh to contend with. Your spirit is saved, but your body is still need to be sanctified. That's a theological term. It means it needs to, needs to be set apart. Need, need, need God to do some work in it. And your mind, God still, some of us still living in condemnation. That emotion, that, that memory just condemning us. The devil used it to condemn us. So it will take a while for us to come into the victory of no condemnation. After a lot of teachings, and we're going to talk more about that, how, how you can live in the Spirit. But your spirit man is saved, very saved. Your spirit man is very connected to God. Now Jesus offered a solution now, how it is that you can align your flesh and your emotion to your spirit as opposed to the other way around. And don't let religious people fool you, thinking, telling you that you need to observe rules. You know, that's the difference I preach about that between spiritual discipline and religious discipline. Spiritual discipline is you do something to, to, to gain something, to, to, to gain strength. The best way to explain it is that when I was a kid, and we are forced to go to gym class, even though I didn't like football, I don't like to be tackled, I don't like to, you know, and we used to live in Calgary, we used to play lacrosse in the middle of minus 40, I hated that, you know, I just didn't enjoy gymnasium, gym class was such a drag for me. I like to, you know, typical Asian, right, sit in the class looking at computers, but anyway, so, you know, I just don't like to go outside, because I didn't see the value. I didn't perceive it. Oh, these days, if you ask me, man, my wife will tell you I'm very diligent in going to gym. <sighs> What's the difference? One is a religious discipline. I have to do it, otherwise my teacher will discipline me and send me to the principal room. Call my parents or do some harm to me or something like that. That was religious. That was, that I have to do it. But now, I want to do it. It's like the same thing most of you, if not all of you, come to this church because you want to come. Yes or no? Nobody put a gun in your head. Nobody tell you if you don't come to church. In fact, I announced in this place, you know, if you don't come, that's okay. God still loves you. And yet you are. 
Why? Because you want to come. It's no longer a religious uh, a discipline because religious discipline is based on fear. You better show up or Pastor Paul is going to know or God is going to know. You don't do this out of fear. You do this out of desire. So, how it is that we align our flesh to the Spirit as opposed to the Spirit aligned to our flesh and being drowned up for our flesh? How it is that we can walk in the supernatural and do the things of the supernatural and witness the power of God in our lives as opposed to allowing our emotion and circumstance and how we feel in our body, the condition of our body, tell us what it is. Well, Jesus gave a solution in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. We're going to, look, we're going to stay there for a few minutes. Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God. If you have your own Bible, if you don't, no condemnation, but if you have your own Bible, this is what I'll do. I'll underline the following. You shall love the Lord your God with all your, number one, heart. And number two, heart basically is spirit. When the Bible says heart, you can interchange between heart and spirit. So that's you. Okay, that's you. You love the Lord your God with your spirit or your heart. Not only that. You know, the Christians say, oh, I just love Jesus in my spirit. And they don't do anything. But Jesus didn't stop that. You need to love the Lord your God with your soul. Your emotion commitment. Your passion. Your thinking, everything that you have in your, in your soul, you love Him. You love Him with your intellect. What does that mean? You submit your intellect to God as opposed to trying to be oppositional all the time or try to always be critical, whatever. You ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. God, teach me intellect. You give me some wisdom. A good place to start is Proverbs, actually. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. Everybody say strength. You know, you have to love God with your strength. There are people who say, oh, I love Jesus. Me and Jesus on the couch. Glory to God. Try that with your wife. Or try that with your husband. Honey, I, I just love you, man. I just love you. Just love you. Just love you. That kind of love can't feed. They don't put food on the table, right? Are you, some of you need to listen to this. Some of you young ladies. I always teach my daughter. Oh, she's here. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> There's a rule. Maybe it's already too late. I mentioned her already. But you know, I always teach young people, you know, love can't put food on the table, man. It's, it's the last one that will put food on the table. Strength. You can't love God the same way. Just with your heart. Oh, God knows my heart. Have you heard people say that? Oh, He knows my heart. My heart is all for Him, really. He knows my soul. Well, if that's the case, then Jesus would have stopped there. Do you know that you need to love the Lord your God with all your, everybody say strength. strength. I, I'm going to let you just, I'm just going to pause there and let you just, just, just mull it over a little bit. Because some of our theology has been so warped. Because a lot of us have been told, you just need to love Jesus. Jesus loves you. You on your own and just do your own thing. And, and just whatever you do is okay. Well, this is the command from Jesus himself. He said, you need to love him with all your strength. Oh, don't let me feel that you feel guilty. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to reveal the truth to you. Don't feel guilty. This is not what we're all about. This is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help us to live in the Spirit. But then you're contending with your soul and your body. Especially the flesh is opposing to the Spirit. And the way to become an overcomer and walk in the Spirit is not only love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Last one is more important because you also need to love your God with all your mind, your neighbor and yourself. Why God mentioned mind again? Because mind is part of the soul. Do you know that your mind is part of your soul? 
You're so quiet this morning. Can I hear loud amen just to know that you're not asleep? Okay, all right. Thank you. Hallelujah. So we have to love God with all our strength. Now, why the mind? Why did Jesus mention the mind again? Because the mind is part of the soul. Why did he have to mention again? This is why. Because it is your mind that decides who you're going to follow. Either your spirit man or your flesh man. It is that mind that needs to change. Paul the Apostle says that we need to be renewed in our mind. Right in Romans chapter 12. Renew our mind. The strongholds in our mind is what cause us not to be able to move forward in the spirit because the stronghold means somebody has built something in our mind that stopped us to make the right decision. Actually, I didn't even plan this. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal, you th- I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by what? Having a nice body? Come on. Renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what the will of God is. Get into the spirit, right? And what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's your mind that actually decides where you go. And therefore, the Bible is teaching us you got to renew your mind. Your mind decides. And unfortunately, a lot of us has been so trained in our thinking, whether it's by the worldly system or by even religious theological thinking, that sometimes we are set in a certain ways that we never want to change. It is that mind that we need to take care of because it is that mind that makes the decision where we're going to go in life. If you're going to follow the Spirit or follow men, religion, politics, or whatever, I will submit to you this morning is that let the whole, come on, let's praise the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit change your mind and be open to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. You'll be surprised the places where God will take you to. So your spirit man is born again. Your spirit man is connected to God. Your spirit man can hear the voice of God. It is your flesh and your emotion. But it's your mind that makes a decision who is going to take charge. So, how then do we overcome and align our spirit Sorry, and align our flesh and our soul to the Spirit. I hear beeping. Somebody's timing me. (laughs) Okay, I promise I'm going to finish real quick, okay? This is how you stay in the Spirit, okay? Number one is to, we just talked about it, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. See, Matthew's not here. I'm going to use him as an example. But don't, don't go and say, your dad told me this. Please, that's not cool. You know, when my father, when he was alive, when I was a kid, you know, he used me as an example, and, and I hated it. And, and, and one of the reasons why I hate it is a lot because after the service, everybody's like, your dad said. <laughs> Can you just spare my son of that grief? Just say, man, your dad think the world. Because I do, I think the world of him. It's awesome. But you know, Matthew's mind is set on getting a brand new top of the line computer. You know why? So that he can play Fortnite and stream. I don't know what's wrong with kids these days. They just love to stream, talk, you know, la, 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 play game, la, 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 la. And then there are millions of people who just follow them. I just told my son yesterday, I said, you know what? Uh, uh, Ken, you know, he, he has this Twitch account. You know, some of you are gamers, right? You have a Twitch account. You know what that is, right, Twitch? So you, he's, I not, he said, oh, he was talking about Twitch account. I said, I wonder if I should put my sermon on a Twitch account. I wonder if anybody will watch. <laughs> Yeah, zero view. <laughs> zero view. Yeah, some of you younger won't understand me. But you know, uh, but his mind is set 
really, every conversation we have, every conversation, uh, Dad, I'm looking for a big computer, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's showing me all the parts that he's buying to put it together, and he doesn't have the money to do it. <laughs> and um, that's by faith. You know, I said to him, I, we gave him some criteria, but, you know, I know he's going to achieve it. But, you know, I said, you know, the money is there, honey. The money is there. You just need to do this. But, you know, he liked to set his things mind on, on computer. You become what you set your mind on. Because whatever you set your mind on is whatever you are obsessed with. When I was obsessed with Juana, when we start chasing, when I start chasing her, I set my mind on her 24-7. I will be praying in tongues and her image will still be in front of me. You think that's God, right? You say, well, what happened to your love? It's still there, it's still there, it's still there. No worries. <laughs> In Colossians, well, actually, let me finish this. So, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. There it is. You have to make a decision to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Everybody says, set my mind my, on the things of the Spirit. In fact, let's make this confession. I will set my mind on the things of the Spirit. Say it again. I will set my mind on the things of the Spirit. He said, what does that mean? I mean, I don't think of anything else. Well, no. You, if you have to go to your job, you have to think about your job, right? You have to worry about, you know, making sure that you do your job. You know, you just can't be, oh, heavenly good. Uh, your mind is all good to heavens and no good to on earth, right? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, what I'm saying is that whatever you, in fact, the next verse is actually explaining it much better. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. It says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Now, the word minds here is being translated from a Greek term. It actually means affection. Some translation says, set your affection on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Where do you set your affection? What is it that you're passionate about, in other words. You can't say that you want to align your body and your soul to your spirit, but your passion has nothing to do with the things of the spirit. If you want to walk in the spirit, if you want to hear from God, you need to set your affection on the things of God, on the things above. It doesn't mean you don't want to, you, you know, you can't like other things. I like, I like things in my life. I like, you know, I like different things in my life. But I've always set my affection on the things above. I could be going on vacation and enjoying myself and I'll be talking to the Lord. Lord, I just, I just love you. I just miss you. I'll be thinking about, you know, church, you know. I'll be thinking about some of the words of God and I'll be listening to its different sermons, you know, just some of the good ones out there can really make me laugh and cause me to learn and grow and different things, right? There's a lot of things that you can set your affection, that cause you to set your affection on the things above. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, you know, some of the old days people always say, read your Bible first thing in the morning, a chapter a day, pray half an hour. And it becomes a religious thing. So people would just go, okay, I don't read my Bible, even though they're not really sure what they're reading because their mind is just somewhere else. But they come to the end of the chapter. It's like, thank you, Lord, I finished my chapter. I guess you must be pleased. And they speak in tongue. Or they pray for like half an hour. Oh, it's all good. Praise the Lord. I, I put in my time. And so therefore God is going to bless me today. And then for the rest of the day, they, haven't, they have no thought of God at all. Well, that's kind of useless, to be honest with you. That's religious. Set your affection. Just You say, I, I don't know how to do that. God, I pray that you cause my affection to turn to you. Lord, let me see things about you, about your kingdom that i never seen before that will draw my affection to you. You can pray that prayer. 
It is not your discipline or whatever. Yes, we do have to have discipline. Paul talked about discipline. I beat myself. I bring in subjection. I understand that. But affection needs to come first. Are you here this morning? Some of us don't have that. Lord, I pray that you stir that affection in me. It is your mind that is going to set in motion where you're going to align your spirit and, sorry, your, your body and soul to. Or that you're going to align your spirit to your body or soul. Number two, almost finished. The Bible says, abide in me and I abide in you. John verse 15. He's a vine and we're the branches. How do we abide in God? A lot of people say, study the Word of God. That's true. Uh, pray, that's true. But Jesus actually explained that. You know, if you want to understand Bible, what Jesus meant, you can speculate or you can let him explain it himself or talk about it himself in other chapters and verses, right? Are you here? I promise I'll be finished soon. So just say amen, just so that you know, I know you're awake. So how do you abide in Jesus? Well, Jesus said it himself. And we're going to do this next week. John chapter 6, verse 56. Whosoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Do you know how powerful communion is? Communion is not a religious thing. If you just come to do religious thing, communion can be just rigmarole for you, for religious purpose, for you to feel better. But you want to abide in Jesus? You have communion with Him also. Smith Wigglesworth, one of the greatest heroes of faith, he has communion every morning. He said, before I put on my shoes, you know, in the old days in England, you know, like they wear shoes at home but you know many of you Asians don't understand that because we walk barefooted because we want to feel the earth right I want to feel what's going on down there so I, I don't feel put on my feet I, I want to feel my carpet you know it's nice and thick you know? praise God but he he, he, he he said before I put on my shoes I would have a communion ooh so beautiful We'll talk more about that next week. Number three is reinforcement. You know, you can't fight the battle, spiritual battle on your own. There's no way. You're not designed to do this yourself. We're not designed to do the spiritual thing, to this faith walk ourselves. You're kidding yourself if you're trying to think that you can do it yourself. We're not designed to walk this out alone. That's why God created the thing called the body of Christ. This brings reinforcements to our faith, encouragement. That's why the Word of God says, do not cease the assembly with one another, even as the day approaches. Why? Why do they approach us? Because the spiritual battle will be more intense. Destruction, distraction will be more intense. And that's why we need to make sure that we stick to each other in uh, Hebrews 10.25. That's the scripture reference you want to put that up. You come to church to grow stronger spiritually, to get reinforcement through teaching, through the love of the brothers and sisters. Well, I'll tell you this, you may not realize this, but we all need friends. As a pastor, I tell you that I've seen some people in this church, you know, they're always to themselves, they're not connected to anybody, and, and bless God, I love them, I, I thank God for their lives, and they're saved, they got the joy of God, they don't even feel condemned. But when they're sick, they, they wonder why nobody in the church ever called them, because they were never connected connected to anybody but I also know of some brothers and sisters who are sick and immediately when the news got out boom the hospital room is full of people so much so that it annoys the hospital staff it's like why so many people in here you guys need to get out of here it's just two at a time you know it's this relationship that we're talking about the family of God God wants you to be part of a household everybody say household household of faith to encourage you, to strengthen you, not to judge you. If you're connected with people that judge you, disconnect yourself from them. Two amens. I'm serious. Even in church, if people are judgmental, you don't have time for them. Just say bye, see you later. Why live your life like that? Live free from judgment. 
You don't need people to judge you. Hallelujah. Besides that, Jesus said, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? Mm -hmm. You come here to learn to grow in wisdom, learn about freedom in Christ, freedom from flesh, freedom from poverty, freedom from struggles and diseases, freedom from fear and frustration, to learn about the righteousness of God, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are connected, to, this is what I call cultivating your spirit, man, right? A lot of our spirit, after we got born again, we never feed the spirit, so the spirit is very weak. We never get exposed to any teaching. We never get reinforcement, so we always get beaten down, choked down by the world, distracted. Things pile up over our lives that completely choke and suffocate our spirit. We don't even know our spirit, man. It's all buried down. But you know, uh, I, I want to tell you this, is that God wants your spirit to be sensitive, to be so strong, stronger even than your will, stronger even than your own flesh, stronger even than your own soul, and that your spirit will actually, that can, that can actually hear from the Spirit of God, will lead you because God leads you by His Spirit, through your spirit. God will not lead you by your flesh. God will lead you by your spirit. That's what when people tell me, you know, I feel like God is telling me something. There's always this red sign going, boo, 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 boo. you know why? Because you don't feel. You are led by the Spirit of God. Who they, the person who are led by the Spirit of God, he who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Not those who are, you know, God lead your spirit with His Spirit. So you need to cause your spirit to be such a strong man inside you to become a dominant force in you because your spirit is who you are. It's who you are. Every eyes closed, every head bowed.